Okay, great. All right, I got confirmation. All the streams are active. We are broadcasting simultaneously on Twitch, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. So, um, welcome. So, uh, my name is Jeffrey Wilson, and um, I want to first um, take the chance to thank the guys at 80, 80.lv for, for uh, giving me the opportunity to do this webinar. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully this will be the first of many, many to come. So, all right, um, let's get started. Um, I'm Jeffrey Ian Wilson, and you're probably asking, who the heck is Jeffrey Ian Wilson? So um, I've been doing computer graphics, 3D, for about since 1993. So I worked on Maya and Max before they were Maya and Max. So um, I've been around for a while uh, doing a variety of different things. Uh, especially training has been a big part of what I do. Keep this pretty simple, quick. Um, if you're interested, a little bit more about me, uh, who I've worked for, um, you can go to my website, stop www.jeffreyianwilson.com, and um, you can peruse that. But in a nutshell, most recently, you know, I worked with a, a general giant in, uh, in Burbank, California, on several major films. Um, most recently, the Fast and the Furious film, um, I've been a character artist at uh, Treyarch and um, Tripwire Interactive. I've been a generalist at um, Logan and in, in uh, Marina del Rey, and uh, I've also done a lot of work for the Army uh, back in Huntsville, Alabama, and NASA, and a variety of different projects. So I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, and skiing has just become my most recently a big part of what I do. But it's uh, just a part of the arsenal. So, all right, um, this webinar is basically going to focus on it's an update to an earlier website i did called uh, single camera head scanning and uh um and you can find this on my website or just you can pretty much just google it you know it's a uh, just type in single camera head scanning with edges off photo scan and adl.lv has got a link to it and i did this video um it was po published on published in 2016, but they actually did the video in 2014. And I think it was one of the first ones to actually do a major um, recorded webinar with uh, Photoscan. And it was a promotion for a, a master class I did on ZBrush workshops then. And things have exploded a little bit. Um, and this is a good place to start. I'm actually going to just kind of follow up. This video, this webinar is going to be a follow up to what I did before. So it's not going to be, I'm not going to cover things in duplicate. The first half of this webinar, the original webinar, when it comes to photography, it's still spot on, pretty much accurate. Um, a few things have happened in Photoscan since then that isn't as accurate. Um, I'll be using Reality Capture in this webinar and not uh, Photoscan um, for a number of reasons, but Photoscan is still a valid application if you choose to use it. And I'll discuss kind of the the uh, the pros and cons of both the tools. So as far as using this kind of subject. Um, so uh, let's dive right in. Um, first thing uh, to go about, just talk about a little bit about photography. Um, this is my subject here. Well, intern Floyd Clinton. Thank him for being my guinea pig. But um, it, it is, you can use, people ask me straight off, and like I said, you can refer to the first um, video I did. I don't want to cover it in duplicate. There's no need to. But in a nutshell, um, Photogrammetry is is creating 3D objects from photography, and it, just very simple explanation. So what we need to do is um, there's a few rules you need to follow. You know, there's a kind of the triumvirate of, of photo photogrammetry, and then you need the subject to be in as much focus as possible um, and as deep as possible. And if you know anything about photography, that means your aperture setting needs to be uh, very narrow or the number actually increases, but the aperture actually decreases in size. It's kind of counterintuitive, but that's how it works. And um, the smaller that aperture gets, um, uh, the more depth you get in focus, which is highly desirable. The problem is there's less light that comes through. So you have to make an adjustment into your other two settings. One is called ISO, which is basically you know, as a digital equivalent of an old film term that basically um, film, you know, 
the old chemical film you actually used to have an ISO setting for different sensitivities to light and you had to buy a different film like a 200 for different light settings and you change your film out depending upon your light conditions and um the ISO sensitivity as it increases you know it the film becomes more sensitive to light but it also lets in a lot more noise and so a high ISO is is high, is not desirable at all you want to keep that as low as possible and then the lastly is your shutter speed and the shutter speed is how long the the uh, the uh, the uh, the shutter the you know the, the iris stays open so so what you have is you have the aperture which is the size of the aperture and the size of the the iris and the shutter speed is how long it stays open and the longer it stays open the more the light comes through but the longer you leave it open you can get some motion blur so if you, even micro motions may blur the subject you know so you have to be careful of that and a rule of thumb if you're shooting handheld is your shutter speed should be at least as fast as twice as your um as your focal length so if i have a crop sensor nikon d5300 which i used in this and i had a 35 millimeter lens and i know that the crop factor on um, a D5300 is a 1.5, so I have to you know multiply, you know, uh, you know my 35 millimeter setting times uh, 1.5, and essentially I have a a shutter uh, effective focal length 52.5. In order to find my minimum settings to shoot handheld, I need to multiply that by two, and so what I get is around 100. So I need to set my shutter speed at a minimum of right that, and that'll kind of uh, account for any kind of slight hand, hand, hand motion and uh, uh, movement with my while holding the camera. So uh, unfortunately, you know, um, the light is a constant problem, especially when you're getting started and you don't have a whole lot of equipment. You have to deal with what you got. And uh, this video is kind of just rolling with the punches and not spending a whole lot of money. And just you know, cranking out a head scan, and this is just basically where a lot of people get started, and 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 this is to encourage that this would be the first of many many things to come. There's obviously much better ways of doing this, um, but they're also more expensive. <laughs> so um, I do have a Nikon camera. It, it's a Nikon D5300. People ask, well, Canon, Nikon, which is it? I said, whichever is best for you. I mean, for your usage. I've kind of always been a Nikon. I've used it since I was photography school. Um, the 5300 was specifically purchased by me because of a specific set of standards at the time when I bought it. It supported things like a you know like a optical low pass filter has been you know removed, um, a few other things, and just stellar reviews. And so, at that time in 2014, that's what I bought, and that's what I still have. I still like it a lot. Now, a lot of other more recent cameras may have these other goodies in it that actually compete or maybe surpass that. So it's really up to you to just do your, your research and to consider one thing that I learned in photography is to invest in your glass, invest in your lenses. You know, if you have ambition to get a full-frame Nikon D810 or a Canon 5 DSR, it's pretty much wise to, to invest in full-frame lenses if you have the money. That way you can always upgrade. You can still use, like I can use a full frame Nikon lens on my crop sensor D5300. But when I ultimately upgrade the body to say a D10 or a D100 or the new, whatever it's coming out pretty soon, I can actually reuse that lens again. So, and it's good to invest in your glass because your glass will last a lot, much longer time than your body will, you know? So it's the, I would not worry so much if your budget is too limited about spending a lot of money on the body you know that's something that you'll actually change out over time and you'll replace it often you know well often every so years but the glass could last 20 years you know 20 30 years even more so you know it's good to invest in uh, something you're going to have it that long it's good to spend the money on it okay that's been enough on photography let me have to call oh pardon me for a second I'm sorry, I had to grab, grab a drink of water. Um, so, um, that's photography, and uh, let's go through uh, shooting methods. Uh, when you're scanning ahead, you have to move very fast. Um, movement is highly undesirable when doing head scans. 
That's why you see in the industry, if you follow anybody, they have a multiple head camera system, say from 1024, 3D Scan LA, or, you know, 4D Max in London, and there's quite a few, and that's all the rage, and it's even become more pervasive since I did this first video, and I'm about three or four years ago, probably the number of studios that support these multi-cameras probably tripled or quadrupled since then. So, but that doesn't mean that this doesn't have a value in it. And for studios that are small, indies that are trying to get their feet off the ground and just don't have the money to actually produce some, you know, expensive head skins, this is a viable alternative. And especially for previs, this is pretty effective. But, um, one of the limitations you have to do is you have to find a subject that can stay still, you know, for for probably about 90 seconds, you know, a minute and a half or two, you know, two minutes at the most. And you need to move quickly, but you also need to remember to stop when you move to take your next shot. You need to remember to stop <clears throat> long enough to, for the shutter to open and close, then move, you know, because sometimes you could, you could be moving and you're hit, opening and closing the shutter, but you're still moving. And given the limited amount of light, unless you have a studio light set up, uh, you, that's going to introduce some blur. In fact, I'll probably show you several images where that happened, where I was, I continued to move even after the, the sub, even after, while I was firing the shutter. So, yeah, so, yeah, there's, here's an instance where the, there's a slight blur because I continued to, to uh, move on it. So, we go back to that shot so you just see the original white balance um let's see um you can use as far as cameras uh you could really start out with a cell phone which will, will be just fine you know uh, or a good cell phone camera just get a raw uh camera app like for i think on android and ios there's one called the fp-5 i think that's what the name of the app is let's see what is it? let me look it up um fp fp5 android I think that's the name of it. FV5. Excuse me. This is a really good raw application that if your your cell phone camera supports it, it can actually re record in raw, which has a, a little bit extra color depth that you can actually do some color correction with. It's very valuable when you actually can set your settings. That's one thing you need to do is is you is once you do find your settings in um in your camera, you need to you know first turn off auto. And there's a question of just testing to find get the right exposure and balancing how much light there is. You know, I shot this in a garage uh, with the garage door open. And so that's why you see a lot of light on the face, but not so much on the back. Um, it's understood, you know, it's, you know, just short of I can't put it out in direct sunlight. Otherwise, the, even that lighting would be even more harsh. And so it's the lesser of two evils. You know, I, I didn't want to erect anything complicated because I'm trying to demonstrate rolling with the punches given what the conditions you're given are so this is what it did so as far as cameras you know you don't need a fancy camera it does help um but a situation like this for single camera head scanning actually a, a very expensive camera isn't going to help you all that much so just because of the nature of people's subjects they move uh one thing about the subject one little exercise i like to do to help them calm down is to get them used to the shutter number one so actually, it's in front of them, take a bunch of test shots in front of them, and people come self-conscious. They have a tendency to watch the lens as you come around. It's just instinct. And so what you want them to do is you get, to get the subject used to seeing it in front. So you stand in front of them, get really close, and then um, uh, just fire off the shutter a bunch of times, and it'll distract them. And then you, you get you, you once they're kind of used to the noise and seeing you, uh, then you tell them to, to to take a deep breath and then focus at a very distant point off in the, the distance, and tell them to to zone out for a second, kind of defocus their eyes a little bit, and then just take some uh, deep breaths in and out, and then breathe through the nose and then relax their jaw. Uh, if you have them kind of keep their lips pursed together, it's, it adds a little bit of tension, and eventually they their lips move. So in the subject tools here in the skin, it did happen. His lips moved a little bit. So that's, that's undesirable. So just a little bit of deep breathing, a little bit of Zen meditation there before you begin. And then you start behind the right ear. That way, by the time you come around, they're kind of used to the noise again. So it's not as distracting. If you start straight up front, people tend to move quite a bit. So a little bit of subversive uh, psychology going on you know when you're trying to deal with and i've gotten really good results from the single 
camera head scans because of this little exercise that I run through. I actually find it to be quite critical, especially people that are nervous and not used to getting their picture, picture taken. So uh, as far as shooting method, um, number one, this software is called DxO uh, Optic Suite. It, um, I use Reality Capture. Uh, the guys at Capturing Reality highly recommend it just because of the way it deals with noise. It's actually processing the noise is uh, much more effective than, say, Lightroom. Uh, it's, it's a separate purchase. It's permanent, unlike Lightroom, which is a subscription. So um, I do have it. I do use it. You know, I use Lightroom a lot just because it's convenient. But uh, this is probably a much more effective tool for processing and preparing stuff for photogrammetry. So you know, check it out. They do have a pretty good trial that lasts 30 days. And my, this trial is expired, and I could still open it and use it. I just can't save things out. So I've yet to buy it myself. So, um, so um, let's talk about the shooting methods. Um, you'll see I started right behind the right ear, and it, you'll see this pattern. If I, if I cycle through this really fast, you'll see this kind of waving, undulating pattern, except when I come around the face. So... And there's a reason to that, just because, you know, if you go, it looks like a little short video, but you'll see this kind of wave, sine wave. And it's just, uh, it's just a natural way that I work. now. You know, it's kind of ingrained in me that to work this way. And well, it gives you the best amount of coverage, and then I stop at the top and go around the head. But it's kind of, this kind of gives you an idea of uh, how and where it didn't, the method to shoot your subject and it becomes almost instinctual after a while there's a lot of muscle memory involved in doing this so but you can see that pattern in the way that i'm moving up and down and i'm constantly moving and stepping and moving at the same same time so the key is like i said just to remember to to stop uh, when you fire the shutter and then move and a lot of times you'll continuously move and fire the shutter at the same time results in blur which is bad and zip and noise so uh let's talk a little bit about processing the images um and dxo i think it did look lightroom in my first video so i was going to cover dxo a little bit uh, it's pretty pretty standard it will automatically download uh, the profiles for your lenses um one thing you want to do is uh is to, is make sure that there's no lens correction taking place so, you know, you can actually, uh, down here in the detail, you can actually disable the lens softness, leave noise reduction on, and then the chromatic aberration. But, oh, that, sorry, that it's crop and distortion are the ones that I need to leave on. So you want to disable crop and distortion because the software itself, the reality capture will compensate for that. So you need to be able to tell it not to undistort the images. Um, uh, one thing about like um, focal length is around 50, 50 millimeters is highly desirable. My software photogrammetry in general, that's kind of a magic number as far as, you know, well, what focal length should I use? And like, because of 50 millimeters kind of balances the, the being able to shoot a, a decent size area and at the same time uh, minimizing distortion. And the lenses are at that um, focal length tend to be fairly affordable and actually quite cost effective in fact for the canon there's a there's a 50 millimeter called the nifty 50 they, they call it. it's very very dirt cheap and it's high quality uh, 50 millimeter prime lens um, prime lenses tend to run a lot uh, cheaper than variable focal length and at an increased quality um so if you're going to run with a, fo a variable focal length um, or zoom le zoom lens um, it would be wise to spend more money because the quality of the images it returns is actually generally inferior. And a, a high-quality uh, variable focal length lens is, it can be quite expensive. And this one, I have a Sigma uh, art lens, which is cost about $1,000, which is more than the body itself that I invested in the D5300. So, um, in fact, I think you get the D5300 body for now for about $500, $450. But my lens has actually held its value. So, you know, that's back to my previous argument or explanation that lens is always a good investment. It'll hold its value. So um, back to to the to this little rhythm. So I'm shooting my little rhythm. Um, I'm going to adjust my images. Uh, first thing you should probably do is white balance. Um, it's a little bit tricky in here. Um, I did a, I used a color chart here, but because of the conditions and the 
the the the um, the the pardon me for a second uh, the garage and I'm actually exposed to the outdoors. I've got two sets of different colored light, and so what I did is an average of between the front shot. So I sample the front, and then I did a, a color balance check on the back, and then what I came up to was a value that was somewhere in between. You know, so if I did a a raw color correction and I selected my white note, it's going to actually be quite turn the image quite orange. So let's select all those. And so it'll actually apply the white balance to to that temperature. So let's go. But then you'll notice in the back and the other ones, they turn a little bit blue. Some of the images turn blue because I'm, I'm moving more into the shade. So well, let's find a good image to find to work on. So here we are. So this is uh, the color corrected. This a bit, seems a bit harsh on the on the orange on the warmth so i may dial it down to pull a little bit more so say 7500 a little bit blue and you know and then the the tint i know so you're just trying to find a, a little bit of a balance you know if they went a bit too much green there so this is pretty much uh in the studio setting you could control your light a little bit better. Oh. So I'm just trying to find an innate I've done this so many times, I'm trying to find an innate balance between the two. So it was actually reproducted. It's consistent across multiple images. A little bit rich. Seventy-eight thousand. Oh, that's about right. Okay. Um, one thing to do, and I've forgotten. We apply it to all. Select all the images, and then just set this again to eight eight thousand. You can comment from LV. That's it, LV. So. Uh, let's see. We'll go into exposure compensation. We probably need to boost this up a little bit. We're going to use the center, center weighted average. Getting a question to check if all screen fit to the translation. <laughs> Apparently we got a little technical issue here. But pardon me for a moment. Is the entire screen um, being able to be seen? Oh, I see what we got here. Okay, an error. I need to adjust my streaming eyes. Okay, I think I got it fixed. Oops, we had a little bit of a problem there. Uh, uh, let me get a confirmation that it started the stream and the, the entire uh, recorded area wasn't being recorded, so it seemed like I fixed it. Uh, let me get confirmation. Did that fix it? Uh, cool, all right, I'm good. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't check my uh, display capture settings in OBS. So, oh, but all right. So we're here. Um, so I was talking about the the rhythmic pattern, and obviously, you guys weren't seeing that because this part was being cut off. So, so what we have here is this. I'm shooting this kind of up and down, um, sine wave kind of uh, of rhythm on how I shot my images. So. This is kind of what I was speaking of earlier. You know, it's kind of, it's become, like I said, muscle memory. I've just, I've done this so many times, it's used to it. And I use it, this method for shooting all different kinds, but it ensures the most, uh, maximum amount of parallax and movement and offset between images 
you don't want to stay still when you're actually shooting your images. You want to constantly be moving, um, except when you're opening and closing the shutter. So, so let's go with, um, let me turn some of these other factors off. So um, what I'm going to do is probably boost, just go with the manual, just boost my, That's probably a bit too much, my exposure up a little bit. So, um, next thing is some smart lighting, which is kind of neat. It will kind of add some extra details into the image. And we're actually processing this for photogrammetry. It's actually me going to pull more, de more detail. The more detail in the subject, the more points that the actual software can pull out. So, and we can actually increase the intensity of that if we want. So, does that and then we can selectively tone and pull up our shadows if we want to you know drop our highlights and maybe pull our mid-tones down a little bit so it comes a little bit more muted and then we can actually turn on clear view which does a little bit more it's kind of changes it not to to uh what's representative because we can actually do this we can record and do one set of images to actually develop the geometry and another set to actually texture the this subject with but uh let me just turn on the micro contrast a little bit and micro contrast kind of helps to pull out some of those little details that are here so that the software can actually lock on to and you'll see i was still moving i don't know if you can tell this there's a considerable amount of blur here uh, where i was moving so I pull the micro contrast up, and, and when I'm done, and I've got a nice set of settings that looks consistent image to image, what I'll do is I'll actually export these twice. So I'll export once for textures, and then I'll export another time for geometry. And what I'm working on here is more for geometry. The textures need to be as close to the original uh, exposure as possible, with maybe a little bit of shadow, highlight, and midtone adjustments, as well as your white balance and um, some exposure compensation so, so the, the other ones where i'm fiddling with the contrast and all these other settings um probably not just leave them alone so so that's enough on uh processing the images next step was to let's build a 3d model from it of uh, reality capture you, this is a piece of software for a company called capturing reality very powerful at the time right now there's a it's a subscription model of of $99 every three months. It's an odd way of doing the subscription, not monthly, but um, so it's not too bad. It's You don't own a copy of it. There's also a Steam version. So if you use Steam and you're an indie, um, the Steam version is actually quite effective because you can actually move your license from machine to machine, uh, unlike um, the, the subscription version, which is actually tied specifically to a specific machine. So if you have a small indie studio with a, you know several Steam accounts, you know, or, and you move from one machine to another, you could start up the the uh, um, the process on one machine, go to another one to work, and actually be able to run Reality Capture. So there's there's a discussion of the 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 differences between the, the subscriptions. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, their interface is a little bit. Um, different than what you're probably used to seeing uh but once you get used to it you actually really like it i do uh i couldn't say it was quite jarring because it didn't quite look like what i was used to as far as working in uh, 3d apps uh, but like i said it, it's it's much better than say zbrush which changed the interface quite dramatically and not to a positive effect but there's a logical tab and and movement through the what's available based upon the tabs as you move through as well as this is your configuration. One of the first things I'll do is actually to change the configuration to this split mode here. And you can change the viewer to, to help. Now, the neat thing about, um, and this to the photograph, the 2D, and then this window is 3D. Nice thing about it is you keep the help open. It's contextual to whatever process you're currently using at the time. So I'll go to images, and then I'll pull in all my, say my image, I've already processed this before. So I pull my images in. I'm 
So, and to take a look at them, I can actually drag and drop them inside here. So I'm going to find another one. And then you can use the middle mouse wheel, the left mount button pans, the right mouse button also zooms in and out. So, you can use the wheel, but it's usually, it's useful to examine some of the images. <coughs> So, so there, there's that. Pardon, had to take a break there for a second. Um, <clears throat> you can double click on one of the images and it'll pull up the statistics for it. Um, one of the first things you want to do is to open up your workflow settings. And like I see, you see how the uh, help menu changed contextually to what, what, what I chose, the operation I was going to choose. I wish every help worked like this. At first, I really derided the software for not having a, a robust help uh -huh. um, a menu or a manual. But uh, it was because it's by standing alone, their menu was actually quite confusing. But with this feature they added to it, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and it's easy to actually figure out what all these small little details mean. But one of the things that's kind of critical is... Number one um, is the create a cache location. And you can actually put that, and the recommendation is actually to put that on a the fastest drive, and then, which is typically, if you have an, a solid state disk, that would be the fastest drive. And if you have a second second fastest uh, SSD drive that, that's not the system, then put it there. And the cache is this just temporary files that the software needs. and. The faster it has access to it, the better. It's also recommended that you move and copy your images to this fastest drive as well. So an ideal configuration would have a, uh, a system with a solid state disk drive, a secondary drive with a solid state disk, and then a third a drive for, for storage, for long ter longer term storage. And then you just move the, the files off the, uh, the second SSD as needed. So, um, so that's about it for the pretty much settings. The one of the nice thing about Reality Capture is the default settings are pretty darn good. If you ever need to reset, you can hold the Shift key down, and then double click on the application icon, and it'll actually reset the Reality Capture settings because sometimes they get a little bit out of whack. So, um, so we've loaded our images. Um, the next stage is to align. And like I hit settings here and align settings, boom, there's my landing settings. So it tells me everything about these advanced settings. Um, I have gone in and changed a few things. I think the default is 10,000 um, max features per megapixel. And then um, max feature per image is set to 100,000. So there's a little bit of math involved on in, in this, but it's actually quite easy to explain. You know, so well, what, what, what is a feature? And then so here you can explain the maximum number of feature points per megapixel for the natural features detector and alignment. And basically what that means is the software algorithm is going through each image, image per image, and it's find, trying to find a common feature, say a pimple or a, or a skin pore, that's common among multiple images, and that's called a feature. So the maximum number of features per megapixel, and a megapixel is basically, what is it, one million pixels, isn't it? So... Let's see, like for my camera, I make a pixel. So if I look at my statistics for my image, it's a, a width of 6,000 or height of 6,000 and a width of 4,000. So, and I know my camera is a 24 megapixel camera. So if you take 6,000 times 4,000, you know, it's 24 million pixels. So 24 megapixels. So the max feature per megapixel is, is basically a multiplier of that. So if, um, and sometimes I've seen people dial in just crazy numbers that are actually more megapixels than the image actually has. So if I would wanted to use the, mo the entire image, you know, I need to be careful. So if I use 10,000, the default is 10,000, so 10,000 
features per megapixel, and then I have 24 megapixels, that's, that's 240,000 points. So if there's 24 million points, that's roughly around, you know, 10% or 10% or one. So we get two extra zeros in there. So um, it's obviously a little bit low, but you have to be careful. If I dialed in, like I saw one instance, someone had dialed in 100,000. And the problem with using 100,000 megapixels is 100 times 24 is that is, you know, 10% of the entire image, which is a bit crazy, you know, so there's a bit too much. I mean, you can have too many features, and not to mention it takes a long time to compute. Um, the maximum, especially if your maximum features per image is set to 100,000, and your max features overwhelms it, so it gets cut off anyway. So there's a nice, there's nice balance, and the... The, the defaults actually come in pretty well. Like I changed mine to like 25,000 and 10,000. Uh, image overlap is just to measure how, what percentage of the image is actually overlap. So if there's a common point here, like, you know, how much at what percentage can it be seen in the image? And it explains it here in the help menu a little bit better than I can. So it's really good. Um, a little bit of other things that I changed here is the pre-selector uh, features. Uh, needs to be roughly equivalent to the max features per image. I think it's recommended it's one quarter or to one half. And I usually only fiddle with this if I'm having trouble with alignment. So, uh, and then I set the detector sensitivity is I set it up to a little bit, be a little bit higher. So it's, it actually take a little bit more time to find those points if it can. And if it can't, it will, you know, it disregard. The only problem with turning your detector sensitivity up too high is it will um, result in a lot of noise. And you will see that my scan did. So I think we're clocking in at 40 minutes right now. So I'm going to process this real quick. So I've already processed this file before. So ahead of time. So the the next step is it's extremely simple. Once you get your alignment settings, you click on the alignment tab, and then you just hit go, boom. And fortunately, for the most part, this uh, solved and found all the cameras or uh, 20, 127 out of the 141. So, and some of them were very blurry, so there's an obvious reason why it didn't solve. So, the first thing you need to do, and you can see that undulating pattern that I mentioned a little bit earlier, where there's this little waveform, so you can see that better in the, in the shot image. So, uh, once you have that, you, know, you can t t wait, tweak, the, tweak the values a little bit. Um, there, there are ways that if there are multiple components, which means it couldn't find a good solve. I could add control points if I need to, uh, but this is a subject for another time. This is a little bit more advanced and a little bit... I could do an entire video just on the little minutia of reality capture. But if you get enough, if you get enough overlap, your light's pretty good, you process the image pretty good, there's really no reason why you shouldn't get more than enough matches to, to suit this kind of method. So... Um, I did it first at a real low resolution, so it set alignment. Then just you just hit the line button. Um, the next step is reconstruction, which actually takes that initial tie point cloud and converts it. Um, what I like to do is actually to reorient my scan by kind of aligning it to the the X Y Z axis, so it orients correctly. So here we are here, and so. Uh, and then the next step is actually to define the region if I want to build the mesh from. And so usually I define it automatically. And then I go into my scene tab and actually um, tweak it manually. So you just click on the edge that you want to limit it to and just move it to be these little fobs. And so I would define that area, move to the left side, and then define it again. So. Manually, is you actually draw the box yourself, so you don't, you don't start with something. But I find that it's useful to use automatic. It gets things done pretty quickly. So um, the next step is reconstruction. If we go back in the settings again, um, I could go through this, you know, if I, you know, but like I said, the help menu does a really good job of explaining everything. And then it's just a question of repetitively using it to get find out what each one of those does. So the next thing is I did a quick um, 
low resolution, which actually down samples the photographs when it creates the, the geometry. And so that's one of the settings over here is, you know, what, what, uh, how many, you know, the image downscale for preview is four. So that means it's one quarter the resolution of the original image. A uh, normal method is basically half. So you can actually dial that in. So if you want a specific kind of look, like I've noticed in hand scanning, that normal is actually probably the best setting um, to use. High just would seem to return too much noise. You know, unless the subject's completely in still. So, so you can adjust those numbers, how much to downscale the image before you process it. And this first head is, is done with a downscale of uh, the preview. So I just did a bit of rough preview and define my volume again. Um, the next one is the, the processed on high. And you'll see that there's actually quite a bit of noise to it. But there's a lot of detail to it, too. So I did keep it. Here's an example where the lip moved here. So here we go. Um, let me make sure. Try to open up my Twitch panel. If there's any questions, I haven't looked over here yet. So um, it's a, it's a pretty easy and straightforward process. I mean, it looks a lot more complicated than it is. Yeah, but it is what it is. Can it, but it can get also very deep at the same time. Uh, I, I kind of liken photogrammetry to chess. In, in other words, I can explain the rules to you very simply, very quickly. But it can take a while to actually put all those kind of the stuff that's non substitute uh, What you see here is pretty on the surface. But there's a lot of deep understanding of the nature of like your center, your lens. Uh, just by experience, knowing where to focus, how often, how many shots give you good coverage. And that just comes with time. That, that's just something that's going to come with time. You know, uh, I found that some people can be very, very good scan techs and can't draw worth a, a squat. Uh, in fact, some studio trained photographers have trouble because they try to frame the subject nice and neat. And if you see in my images, you know, it's not nice and neat. It's kind of an angle. And well, why did you shoot at an angle? Well, I'm trying to maximize the number of pixels that the, the, uh, that the camera is modifying. So you actually end up with an ugly picture. What someone would consider, that's not a very attractive picture because of the frame. Well, it doesn't matter because you're trying to use as much of the real estate as possible. So, which explains a lot of stuff. So, uh, back to reality capture. So we got a high processed it's a bit, just a bit too noisy. You, you're going to, you're shooting a handheld. There's really no way around it. But I did get some nice wrinkle details here, up in the forehead, and there's some other minor details that came through. The nose, the, the ears came through really nicely. But you have to smooth those out. So the next step again is to, um, as I, you know, just cleaned it up, process it again, and then I dropped it to, to 20 million uh, triangles using. If you go in the reconstruction tab, the filtering and simplify tools are pretty helpful. Filtering is let you define a box and then say select a bunch of errant points and delete them. So or polygons, triangles. And then simplify actually decimates the skin. So I decimated to 20 and then brought it into ZBrush. Um, this is kind of a quick remeshed model that I did, you know, reproject the textures. But once you're ready to texture the model, you go to reconstruction, just hit that texture. Now, the texture settings are a little bit different. Um, you have to be careful of it. Um, there is, it's here in the coloring and texturing tab. The maximal texture resolution is usually set at 16K. Um, that's a pretty good number for photogrammetry, but, you know, for a subject like this, really the head needs to be, you no. Know, it's, it's a crop sensor camera. I didn't shoot too tight. Uh, 16K may be a bit overkill, overkill, you know, so. And I can't bring a 16K map into ZBrush anyway. So a lot of times I'll just set it to 8K. Um, the style is how the software applies UV coordinates to the scan. So, um, and how it's distributed. Maximal texture count, that means that I could define a number of maps that I want the UV space to occupy. So I could say, you know, and 4096 is the recommended maximum, <coughs> you know, for a lot for game engines and 
the software and rendering, you know, so what you have to say, okay, I want four, 4k maps. And so you could define that there or a single, and in this case, when I did a single 8k map. Now, the nice thing about it is I could continue to sculpt came up, but I could always come back and re unwrap and actually apply new textures. So you need to get something that's able, you can work with first. Um, this is another shot. Let me see. This is processed at normal. So you can see that uh, a lot less noise. Uh, pardon me for a second. I'm sorry about that. I'm back. Um, gosh, when you talk for an hour straight, your throat tends to get raw. Oh, um, so, uh, you know, as you'll see in the normal processing, it's downsampled the image by half, and it's got rid of some of that fine noise. So that's kind of a good place to start with. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up ZBrush. And then, but we need to get rid of all this other crap that's around it first. Give it ZBrush a chance to, to load up. So, <clears throat> some people have asked me if some of these features are available in ZBrush Core. I have not used ZBrush Core, so I cannot confirm or deny or tell you what features are supported. You know, skin cleanups are usually pretty, Dynamesh is pretty, I think, high on the list of, for ZBrush, so I kind of doubt it, but I'm not sure. Um, Let's load this up, my processing. We determined that the high just had too much noise and didn't return enough. So this is already kind of a rough cleanup. And the, I, the objective of this is just to get something that's nice and rough and clean up. I could sculpt on this to actually get it to be much more detailed, of course. But uh, this is just rapid you know, production, like might be suitable for digital extras, for visual effects film, whether real small or for previs or for, you know, the starting of a, a much more detailed character. And this is kind of a method I followed at Tripwire uh, working in the game, Killing Fort 2, was a hand scan and then I'd sculpt to make it more realistic. But pardon me. So let me kind of back through the thing. So this is the low resolution brought in to ZBrush. And so obviously... I need to get cut away a lot of garbage. So uh, the first thing I do is probably, you know, is I trim away. So I just hold down control shift, change it to uh, lasso. And then what I do is I just select portions of this. Whoops, that's the, the image and hide. Oops, I got a, no wonder it's not showing. So I'll select this part of the shirt, then invert the selection. And then what I do is delete, modify the topology and delete the hidden. I'm sorry about that. I had that off for a second again. Um, you know, a little bit of a sore throat. So, um, so uh, I continue to clean this model up, <clears throat> and uh, and then maybe I did a little bit of smoothing on it. So what you'll, you see here is a kind of smooth down version, and this is basically becomes my my base mesh.
So this is the, the low resolution um, gen generated model. And I'll use this and actually just kind of smooth it out, clean it up a little bit, use DynaMesh, close it off, and give myself a reasonable quad size that I can sculpt um, and then subdivide and project the details as needed. <coughs> and so what I did is, is this is the, I brought in the, the medium model, <coughs> which is here. Let me pull it up and hide these others. So, so I brought in, this is the medium resolution or the normal resolution scan. And you can see the movement because there's this little break here in the neck and the lip. So his jaw, he adjusted his jaw somewhere in mouth, somewhere at some point during the scan. And so what I do is I have the low resolution one here. I, uh, I then in turn, um, uh, duplicate it <coughs> or <coughs> subdivide control D to subdivide. Oh, I'm subdividing the wrong thing. I think I may just crash the ZBrush at the wrong one selected. There we go. <coughs> so I subdivide and then with this showing the low, the high res one, go down to morph target, delete the morph target, and basically storing the, the low resolution version the position first before I project. And then I just go to the project tool and I dial in a little bit number and I project all. And give it a chance. Um, one thing prior to this, oops, I think I'm, I just crashed the brush. Is it probably is apply a UV unwrap um, prior to that that step? So give it a chance to load up. So I'll load this up here. I'll go to uh, load my tool back. Right. Oh, so let's load them back up, back up. So there's a low resolution one. Here's our uh, normal resolution. So prior to subdividing this, what I'm going to do is go to a geometry. Let's see, um, which we delete the resolution. Oh, I know what I need to do. Still has Dynamesh activated. I can Dynamesh this object first. Turn it off. And then go to we could create a UV map by grouping this first. So I could actually select bottom. See here. Oops. So this is just for rough UVs. So I go to polygroup, create a group visible, and then hide it. <coughs> And select the face. <coughs> so the ears connected and then group visible. And show the polyframe. So I have like three different kind of ZBrush, you know, groups. <coughs> then I go to uh, UV Master and then uh, turn on poly groups and then unwrap. So uh, I just saw a comment, you know, on the Twitch forum about reusing the color.
and the photos and a good UV mapping is great. And that's the purpose of what we're trying to do is get a bunch of good UV map layout before we uh, try to bring it back into uh, reality capture for texturing. So, so I'll give it a chance. We'll give it a chance to load up. Okay, um, so we have it here. So there we got our UVs laid out. Um, the next step is we can check them by going to the UV map and hit morph UVs. It kind of show us a layout. So we got a decent layout that actually uses the texture to its best. We might kind of change the islands a little bit, but that'll, that's fine for now. So, so we've got good UVs or decent UVs, much better than before. And then we'll go back to our sub tool. We'll sh subdivide this once, and then go to the morph target, delete, store it. Or you do this, it will also save our file. So um, once it's saved, then we'll go back to our sub tool, um, show the normal resolution here, go to project, and then just hit project all. What that's going to do is basically wrap the the low resolution scan to the high resolution scan. So, but it's also going to pull in a lot of noise, but we can use a morph brush to kind of selectively erase what projections we don't want. <coughs> so, give that a chance. I'm going to pause this for a second while that what processes. It shouldn't take but a few minutes. So, pardon me. Well, that computed pretty fast. Um, so, so it's projected, so we can hide the normal. So this is all nice and neat with the UVs, but you'll see there's a bunch of garbage we need to get rid of <coughs> up here on top of the head too. So what we'll do is we'll change hit B for brushes, M for, and then we M to select the M labeled brushes, and it, then we'll select the morph brush. So uh, here we are at the Morse brush, and basically I can paint out that deformation I don't want. Um, makes them look like a fryer. I don't want to do that. So I can change the intensity, you know, the slight intensity, and just brush it in slightly where it's obviously wrong. Click and just keep some of the other stuff. Um, obviously, the stretching and the projections happen too much around the neck. So, and I use the the soft edge of the brush to kind of clean that up a little bit. <coughs> so it's morphing those, that, those points back to the original <coughs> that I defined. Um, <coughs> we could also kind of um, use a combination of the smooth brush and the morph, and we could add that noise back in. We can sculpt that noise back in. This is probably a case where I might use the smooth brush more. Than anything else so now it, this becomes a an exercise in sculpting <coughs> end of this class this webinar is not about sculpting in zbrush but you've got a clean watertight model you have to just basically be sure to go in and see these little projection errors you have to go in and kind of click your shift tool to shift select to kind of get rid of these spikes but if you were through one to 3D print, you could always sculpt out some of the ears and define some of this, you know, smooth out some areas if you wanted to. But um, you know, what you'll end up with if, you, <clears throat> if you're careful is a, and your cleanup is a nice watertight model, which is great for like 3D printing. So, or, you know, so a model. Um, we could come up with something a little bit lower and remesh this for, for games using a tool called Rat3. I mean, we're already closing in on an hour. So maybe I'll do a wrap three on another session. Yeah, we're already past an hour right now. So um, let's see. I'll go back to ZBrush. I'm going to wrap this up part. 
then introduce you to wrap that software, what it does. <clears throat> so, so we've got this um, nice sculpted, you know, uh, corrected model. <coughs> and here it is right here. Or, no, the second one is the one that's nice and sculpted. So here's my kind of cleaned up, kind of tightened up. It's not the best sculpting job. But this is the idea was to get this in rapidly. And I think I spent no more than five minutes kind of cleaning this up a little bit. So it's clean enough for this purposes. So the next thing you do is to import that model. So we go to the reconstruction, import, import model. And the one thing is you have to, it has to be the exact same name as what you exported it as. So, so you have to just be careful about, you know, make sure. And so I, what I do is if I import a new one for ZBrush and name it, I may rename the old one exported from reality capture as dot old or give it a little additional extension. So I brought it in and this is the, the sculpted version, you know, and then actually project the texture and then projecting the texture. It's pretty straightforward. You just hit texture button again, gives you a nice clean. And then when you export it, um, <coughs> of course you'll change the name. And then you'll choose what files format you want. So, and if you were selective, if you double click on the model, <coughs> it'll give you statistics. So about that model, <coughs> which is actually quite useful. So, um, and then you export that out and bring it back in. And then you can actually use that texture information <coughs> as a mask to actually add additional detail to the to the file. I mean, you could run it through a little high pass technique, which and you can use as a mask. <coughs> I covered that in the first video. Um, pardon me. Oops, got a bit of a cough. Um, so we can pull that in, and like I said in my first EdgeSoft video, that um, that process is actually shown in depth, and it's like I said, it's free. You probably refer to the latter two thirds of it. But basically, we open up the tech color map in Photoshop. I think I'll just go ahead and run through it real quick so, <coughs> and show you how to do it. Might as well. Pardon me. So, let me pull it up. Give it a, ch give it a chance to do. And clean up. So this is, I didn't have nice clean UVs here in this image, <coughs> which I should have done. So, um, but it's easy. It's pretty. It's pretty straightforward. <coughs> you do a, a other a filter, other high pass. You choose a number that's relatively shows some of the detail, but not too low or not too high as well. So usually five is a pretty good number. <coughs> then you just adjust the contrast until you end up with a uh, a black and white map. We'll pull the saturation out of it. Okay. And then what you want to do for the image adjust curves and you want the where the gray that's the neutral where it's white it, it comes up <coughs> and where it's black it goes down and unfortunately there's not kind of an offset set for the <coughs> deformation <coughs> so what we'll do is we'll we're going to invert the, and make sure that both the up and down happens at the same time so 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 we're pulling, we're basically remapping those details. And then we adjust the levels again. So we got a nice little mask that we can use. And then we save that out as <coughs> a mask dot JPEG. <coughs> then we open a ZBrush file, go to texture. Import mask the texture the mask flip the UV why they have ZBrush makes you do that I just do not know 
you know, select the texture map here, the mask. <coughs> the next step we're going to do is go to masking. And we go to mask by color and then mask by intensity. So now we're going to hide the mask. Go to texture map, hide the texture. And then what we could do is use a, the standard brush. And what we can do is actually just use your, your, your tablet and then change the intensity to something relatively low. And we can zoom in and we can actually just kind of brush that, those details in just gradually. No. Okay, do I have my mask activated? Oh, there we go. A little bit too much there. So pull, oops. So you see it's pulling a little bit of the details in there. The skin pours and and this is kind of a hack. It's kind of a generally frowned upon <laughs> in the community, but you know, it's a cheap way of getting some details if you're on a budget and you know just need, or if the, the textures of the characters are going to be small, but it adds that little bit of extra uh, realism to it, <clears throat> being it kind of the skin, skin and pore effect. You know, you can actually use the Alt key to reverse. You know, the make it actually come out. So, like I might do that for the hair. But it just breaks that nice smooth, <coughs> that smooth effect down a little bit. So, it shows up really nice in the normal map. <coughs> so, so what you end up with is a pretty, pretty decent little model. Okay. Um, that is, <clears throat> I'm having some issues. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think that I'm going to wrap it up there. I think I'm going to maybe follow this up with another free webinar some other time about using wrap. A um, little court, a quick thing on wrap. It's a program called Ru Russian 3D Scanner is the name of the the website. And um, they, he has some... Uh, the developer has some videos, but RAP is a super fast way of, of remapping the 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 re pre generated geometry onto a mesh. Now, do I have time to do that? Ah, what the hell? I'll just go ahead and do it off Soldier Fourth. Do this. So That's an hour. Normally about hours, you know, 30 minutes is the limit of a webinar. So thank you for those that are hanging in. So, so, um, so what we'll do is we, I'm not going to cover the, the basics of this, but I'm just going to go run through this. So I can load my geometry. <coughs> I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's a nice little node based operation of the way it, things operates. So I've loaded my geometry. I can load a, say a head. <coughs> so there's my, my remeshed, there's my scanned head. <coughs> and there's my remeshed uh, uh, low resolution head. And change this to a different color. Okay. So you can see it. So the first thing that I need to do is a register and align one head to the other. So this is roughly to scale, if I remember correctly, the remesh. So I need to change the, 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 the scan. What I do is hit tab, alignment, go rigid alignment. The first one is the 
what is the original, I think, and then the second one is the target. Fixed geometry. So the fixed geometry is, nope, got it mixed up. Uh oh. So the fixed geometry is the remeshed head. <coughs> Loading, reloading that model again. Let me just do this. That's the fixed, that's the variable. So alignment, rigid alignment, <coughs> fixed. <coughs> and this is the, the variable. So now we go in our little editor. <coughs> Max scale. No, I have an issue here. The scale is not showing up. <coughs> Digital alignment. <coughs> oh, point correspondence. All right, sorry. About to see that I have to create another node called select points. And then connect these points together. It's been a while since I used wrap. Amazing how this quickly the knowledge disappears from your head. So um, <clears throat> what we do is just do a, a rough correspondence between points on the, the mesh on the left and the right. So so we'll get the corner of the eyes. Make sure the numbers correspond to each other. Okay, the bridge of the nose. And click and drag to move the, the item corners in the mouth. <clears throat> then the mouth here. Maybe the chin. <clears throat> neck. And then maybe the corners of the ears here. Bottom of the ear. Maybe the bridge of that ear. And then the forehead, we'll go with the forehead. <coughs> and once you have that, <coughs> you'll have the viewport, the, that head will match and create the scale to the the original model. Sorry for the delay there for a second. So now hit the original scan. Now it's a register and a line. <clears throat> now we just do a, a simple wrap uh, procedure. So I'm going to do a, a wrapping algorithm. So I hit wrap. I select the floating geometry is the, the remesh. The fixed geometry is the the um, the scan, and then the the selection of points is here. So that's the left. Nope, I need to use a, a different one, a different uh, selection points. Selection points here. That's the floating geometry is the, the, the remesh. The rigid geometry, fixed geometry is the scan. Oh, it should be fun to use that one over again. And then this tells it what to ignore. This, uh, this object, this little selector tells I can choose to ignore uh, certain parts of the geometry if I want to. I could plug that into here, go into my polygon selection, and I could tell it to ignore, let's say if it had a mouth bag, which it doesn't. <coughs> I could tell it to ignore certain things. <coughs> like the nostrils, I could tell it to select the nostrils. <coughs> so 
so it would ignore the nostrils. <coughs> when computing this model. <coughs> so I have here. <coughs> Oops, I need to use the fixed, <coughs> <coughs> fixed realigned scan, not this one. There we go. <coughs> so I select it, auto compute. It should run. <coughs> I'm missing something. <coughs> Let me pause the video for a second, or pause the audio for a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's been a while since I used this software. So, so that's that point in the original mesh. So I get to redefine. Since I changed the orientation of the scan, I've got to change the orientation of the selected points. And I would spend a lot more time to to orient this, but uh, you can get the sense of how powerful this remeshing system is. Then let's go to here. Choose the neck. Choose the forehead. There, base of the skull would be about right there. Okay, so now we have those points defined. Let me go to wrap. And hit compute. 3D point P port. Hide that. And it's not working. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Uh oh, I didn't plug it in. Sorry. <laughs> oh boy, I'm slow today. And it still doesn't want to work. Did I get these mixed up? Make sure a different selection. So let's select points. <coughs> Wrap. That's the polygons. I'm having a crash. Something to do with the <coughs> something that's not operating correctly. <coughs> oh, there we go. <coughs> Sometimes I get these mixed up. I've got my wires crossed. Gosh, I hate to do this. This is why I didn't want to cover this this section right now. Don't do it. So it looks pretty bad. <laughs> I've done this a million times. Oh boy. Uh, I know I didn't want to cover this because it hasn't been a while since I touched it. So, uh, gosh, this would this is something I did. To open up an old file, pull it up. Um. So I got the original alignment. A soldier with me for a second. Like I said, it's just been a, a little bit since I've done this before. So I've got my rigid tools here. I went to um, alignment wrap. So the, the, you use this to select the points, and it's basically telling it to ignore the the selection here. Um, this, this point correspondence deals with um, the, the common points. So. Uh, I need to create a new input here, and this is the right geometry is the original here, left geometry is this one here. I think that's where I messed up, is I had the wrong connection here. So, and then the 
fixed geometry is what does not move, which be the scan. And then the, the movable geometry would be this one here. Although I probably need to load in the There we go. I did it finally. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> so I just hit compute. And what it's going to do is it's going to shrink wrap to uh, those points. <laughs> I'm a little slow this morning, guys. So you have to forgive me. So, um, so this is, this kind of really shows something going really, really fast. You know, and the, the technique is, is, is to get something to remesh, get it done quickly and then get it out the door quickly. So now the the professionals out there that have seen this more could probably have a better idea of how this could fit into a pipeline, you know, and, and, and zip, zipping it up and making the resolution much higher. So um, it's kind of up to them to do that. Here you see in the solve that there's some of the neck that's missing. So we may need to adjust the base geometry or create our own geometry first in Maya. And delete that neck which is obviously wrong so the ear is kind of off on the this side so what we'd have to do is go back to select um points and uh, we never did select the points did we so corner of the eye corner of the eye corner of the eye corner nose and so that was without point selection and it did pretty good excuse me and the chin then the uh Top of the ear, bottom of the ear, uh, top of the ear, bottom of the ear, uh, base of the skull, then the top, maximum mark the fit on the forehead right here, boom, probably about right there. So now we'll go back to wrapping and then hit compute again, and it doesn't like it. It does not like my selection points for some reason. So, anyway. I have to go back through. I'll do this again. But the concept is pretty solid. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to end the, the webinar here. So, uh, one little thing to follow up with. Gosh, I don't like to end up like this, but uh, it's, we're closing in on an hour and a half. This is going way over, more than I expected. This is probably a full-on session. I do get carried a little way with these things sometimes. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to probably cut it off right here because this has been it's quite a bit. Uh, hopefully, people got quite a bit of information. Uh, this has been kind of an experiment for AD Level and I to try to get this done quickly and off the ground. Um, if anybody has any quick questions, I can go over them in the Twitch, and then those questions to be relayed to me. But as you can see, that geometry has been remeshed and reprojected, and I can actually take and inherit the texture. So I basically got a decent asset. If you're an indie house and you work with scans, you can actually spit out something quick. Uh, before I take the questions, I do want to point out in my website a little bit of self-promotion that uh, I do have some things that are uh, classes I do offer online you know some are for sale some are for not some are for free some are for not and and um, I'm actually conducting a, a a much more intensive class right now of a, a, a master class which is so basically I'm going to occupy my entire uh, full-time it'll be a full-time job for me and the, the the goal was I was my portfolio really needed a big renovation, you know, and uh, an update. And I was going to run through. I'm a generalist, so I was going to try to do every step of the process and creating kind of a, a a quick alpha demo game, you know, based upon a short story that I'm a big fan of. And so I was going to create a, as part of a comprehensive portfolio piece for myself. You know, I figured, well, why not bring some students in and give them the opportunity to basically tag along while I create this new center master portfolio piece so but you can go to the website and actually check it out and if you're interested and sign up um the f people who have been generally extremely happy with my uh with my tutorials it's, there are um this was kind of last second this one to put together hopefully i get some good information but kind of stumbled a few places here and there one thing i will add as well 
is to go to the Facebook 3D Skating Users Group. So you go to facebook.com slash 3D SUG. So facebook.com groups slash 3D SUG. And that, that's, I admin this group, and there's about 15,500 members in the group. And it's extremely um, um, a great resource to use to talk to other people that are in the industry, you know, find work. Um, there's a not, strict no marketing um, policy. So even I'm preventing from directing, posting links directly to my tutorials, which sometimes I wouldn't, but, but it's been for the best, and it's actually a very good community, and I highly recommend you go there. So um, that, I think they're going to call that quits for today. Um, the next one we'll do is probably be a little bit more, you know, I think we, we, we organized the Twitch and stream and everything is like the last second because, you know, we're trying to get this done. But, uh, you know, hopefully this will be more more to come, free ones to come. Uh, like I said, I want to thank the guys at 80 Level for giving me a chance to do this. And I, I want to close up with some questions since it's been about 90 minutes and people sent, tend to fall asleep if you go beyond an hour, let alone 90 minutes. So um, any questions? I, I'm, I'm, I'm eyeing the Twitch stream, so maybe can, he'll, that'll get relayed to me. And there's a little bit of a delay, so I'll let it go there. So, um, sorry, I'm going to go through the Twitch stream. Let's see what we got here. I'll just do it myself. Uh, Sean's process, thank you. Thank you, Polygon. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kalu, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And more streams for Jeffrey. We're quite awesome. Uh, I do it's about Lumberyard and Unreal. Some of the other ones, that's good. Um, Great. It seems like there's not a whole lot of questions here. Uh, it's pretty simple. I, I highly recommend you check out the first video I did. And uh, like I said, if you did like that, then you can uh, take a chance or consider purchasing the other videos, which I think people have been quite happy with. So we'll see. Yeah, remapping the UVs wouldn't be crucial. So yeah, I think I covered that process. Uh, there's not a whole lot of questions here. Okay, um, I think that's going to be about it. Um, again, my website's jeffreyanwilson.com. Be sure to always revisit 80 Level. These guys are great. Um, they are my go-to, my go-to resource on a regular basis for news. I cannot tell you the number of bookmarks I have saved from their streams. I've probably got uh, uh, 200. Uh, never, I've never seen a more pertinent collection of, uh, and I'm not just kissing their ass because they're putting this. I'm truly, I've, I was a big fan of theirs before we kind of got hooked up. Just doing this tutorial is kind of a test to see about doing education material for them. But um, you know, I genuinely find that they're they're pertinent, and there's tons of little tutorials here and there that uh, they're there, and I think they want to expand it to more streaming type stuff for their offering. So I want to give a big thanks to them. Uh, they've been a big help, and uh, thank you very much. I was going to do anything. Let me see if there's anything else I need to do before I sign up. I'm finishing up. If the boss man will let me go. I'm just using the chat to contact him. Okay, great. Uh, I'd say Creel said actually turned out very good. <laughs> so it's a forgive. It's a good test for me to begin with. I mean, these things are always a little bit, you know, uh, uh, a little bit underprepared and think of it. But uh, for the most part, it actually sounds like everything worked pretty well. So we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next time. Bye.